children, you can go to kids' worship. River Kids. Thank you, Matt. Where are we at on temperature this morning? Everybody's a heads up. All right, we're good. I hadn't planned on being in a series, but I think it's going to be a, a, at least one more. It is a two-part series at this point titled, What If? Uh, last week, the question was, what if you expose the greatest lie in your life that nobody knows? We all have them. And it resonated with people to the degree that I continue to receive texts and emails because reality is we do live in a world where we hide things. Hence the song that we just sang, that if we're honest. And I'm not talking about being honest with your spouse this morning or your children, which has to happen. I'm talking about being honest with God. What if you told God everything that's going on in your life? You know, we have this, this sense that, oh, we have this relationship with God, and he does know everything, by the way. But we don't share everything with him. And our honesty, many times, is withheld. And if you're withholding the honesty from God, you're withholding it to your spouse, or more importantly, yourself. The truth of the reality. Jesus says that the truth will set you free. And we run around saying, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, I've been born again, hallelujah. And you live in bondage. I love what Ken Davis says, if that's the truth that's touched your heart, then you need to tell your face. Because you don't look like it. I'm glad you're here today. Because we love Jesus, right? We love the Father. We love the fact He gave us the Holy Spirit. We're in love with this. We're in love with the fact I told the grandkids this morning, praise God, we got to have them for eight days. They don't live in New York or California. We get to commute, pick them up, take them home. We talk about Jesus all the time. We talk about this in the morning when we get up, we have church in the garage. And we talk about the Bible stories when we go to bed. But if the truth sets you free, then you are free indeed. Do we believe in the fact that God the Father, eternal Father, created everything, gave us his Son, took away the sins of the world, died, rose, ascended into heaven, gave us his Holy Spirit? We believe in that? That's the truth. So if the truth sets you free, why aren't you free? One of the hardest things for me in the ministry to get past. I had this presupposition in my head that everybody's going to receive the Holy Spirit, everybody's going to receive salvation, and everybody's going to live this life of love. And by the way, did you know that the hippies from the 60s had it right? They wanted one thing. They wanted people to live in community, they wanted people to live in fellowship, and they just wanted to be loved. They weren't that far off. What they were rebelling against was a denominational system that had moved church over here, and they were over here, and they, we don't fit into this. Did Jesus fit into it? No. And he rebelled against it, and he said, listen, you guys, you Pharisees. So we're going to go back to the master that, that lived this, and we're going to read some of Paul's teaching this morning, and we're going to take it apart. Not a long message by no means, but a very impacting one. Philippians 3, verses 8 through 11. If this truth is going to set us free, we're going to figure out how. This is the text from last week. Just a couple things I wanted to pull out of it. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of a couple things. All things. All things. And all the things that I have lost, I count it all as rubbish. And in order that I may gain Christ... And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. A righteousness from a God that depends on faith, that I may know him. There's our word, that you know when you know or that you know. And that I have the power of his resurrection. I just explained this to the kids last night. I said the power of the resurrection is simply this, that what God did to his son, and grandkids are sharp. They said he killed him. I said, yeah, yeah, well, okay. What he did to his son in the resurrection, he'll do to you. 
That's why we have the hope of the assurance that when we close our eyes in death, he rose Jesus back to life, he rises us back to life. The knowing of the power of the resurrection, that I will never die, and that I have to share in his sufferings, and I will become like him in his death, and that by any means possible, I will attain the resurrection from the dead. Again, just let me explain verse number 11. He's not saying that I have to work for the resurrection, but I will live a life to attain the life that Jesus secured for me. Jumping ahead to chapter number 4. After he gets done saying this, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Can you? Can you, can you live every day and say, I rejoice in the Lord? Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And here's the, the thesis for the message today. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I love reading Paul because he's such a master author. Look at this. He says, let your request be made known to God. Request means your heartfelt, inside emotions, feelings, heart, pain, issue, everything. Bring it to God. And when you bring everything to God, look what you get. Peace. When your requests are made known to God, you get a peace of God. Isn't that cool? Peace of? They're like, he's in you? The peace of God? Am I the only one that can? Peace of God. I got a peace of God. You got it? I got a peace of God in me, filled with the Holy Spirit, which I don't get, because how do we get that? That surpasses my understanding. I love Paul. And this peace will guard your heart, your mind, because it's in Christ. We're, we're dealing with a guy who says this about himself. I, I was an amazing dude. My name was Paul. And I was born a, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was from an elite tribe of the Benjamites. And my righteousness, when you read the beginning of the chapter 3, he says, my righteousness was found, my righteousness, in what I did for God. Because that was the Old Testament system. I made sacrifice. I went to the temple. I studied the law. I did this for Yahweh. Let me tell you something that he got. God doesn't need us. And Paul got to that point. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I did all these things. And I was so in love with the law of God that I persecuted the new church. In fact, I didn't believe in it. I wanted to take the Christians out, or the Church of the Way, as we read it in the New Testament. That's who I was. But he says, listen, I'm going along one day, and this God steps into my life, and he says, what are you doing? When you read it in Acts, it says, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And he says, I had to step back, I had to go to a motel, and I sat in total darkness for three days, and I was letting this God impress himself upon me. And when this God impressed himself upon me, I realized that I was separated from him, and I was never going to have a relationship with him, and I had two options, to sit on a corner with a tin cup and a white cane and sunglasses for the rest of my life, and beg for food, and be separated from this God, or receive him and live a life teaching about him. Ananias came, he received Christ. Mankind's been changed ever because of his conversion. Here's what Paul's saying. All of these things that I suffered, all things, notice very carefully, he says not 50%. Everything I suffered, I count it as loss. And if you fill the place in your heart that is void with anything else than Jesus, it's rubbish. Totally worthless. My Old Testament professor, Pastor Sankson, 
preached to us, taught us, and told us, he said, unless people understand the depravity of their separation from God that we study in the Old Testament and that we bring forth to the New, he said, unless they get that they are separated from God, you will never sit in the face of Jesus Christ. You will not share at the table. You not, will not be one with him unless you realize the depth of that separatedness and that you will spend eternity in a darkness where there is no hope they will never understand the height of the glorious gospel. And Paul says that. Paul explains that. So if you never realize how bad you need Jesus, you'll never realize how great he is. Right? And many of us have grown up in Christian communities, Christian homes, and we don't have a, an understanding of the depth of the depravity of being separated from him. But I encounter people all the time who are separated and they don't realize it. Hence the reason, what if you told God everything? What if you were honest with him today and shared everything, made all your requests known to him? You see, we go through life in the 21st century where we want to do and talk about anything and everything, but we never talk about what's real. And the more we do it, the further we are getting away from God. Everything is up for debate today. But we can't even say the name of Jesus. So we're pushing Jesus aside so that we can think that we're actually getting to be somebody when we're turning into nobodies. So the further we push Jesus away and we say, oh, but now I'm real and we can come out of the closet. The closet used to be a place you put clothes in. Now it's for strange people to come out of. Right? Because we don't want to talk about it. Because if I don't talk about it, I don't have to deal with it. So today, we're seeing people who are influenced by issues in their life because nobody talked about it. Do you realize your actions today are based off of what you witness? How did you learn how to talk? You watched your parents. How, why do you, you it's a hard thing to get your mind around. People who start smoking, start smoke, snort, start smoking, snorting, <laughs> they do that too. Start smoking because of what? They watch somebody do it. People who drink alcohol, drink alcohol because they watch somebody to do it. When the guy got stupid and stuck his head in the pail or shoved it through a wall or whatever he did, they thought, oh, that's cool, I'll do that too. Been there. Right? Because we we're influenced by what others do. So why, if, we're, if we're Christians, we want to influence our kids on our actions on what we do. We want to influence the community by what we do. But today's society, we would rather push the issues aside, including Jesus, because we don't want to talk about that. That's almost taboo. It's something that, oh, Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, as he thinketh in his mind, so he is. What do you think about? What do you... Are you addressing these issues in your life today? Why not let the mind of the master be the master of your mind? But we would rather think on other things. And hence Paul says, if there's anything other than Jesus Christ filling the void in your life, it's all rubbish. Henry Ford says that the hardest thing to do is think. That's why so few people do it. And he goes on in that article to say, that that's why he was able to make the assembly line work. Because he figured out a way where people could be employed and gain money without thinking. That's sad. But he said the hardest thing for people to do is think. That's why so few do it. There used to be a time when women knew they needed a husband to have a baby. We're stopped talking about these things. And I can honestly say that God does not associate with secular humanism. I deal with it. New Age Christianity. And God says, listen, anything other than Jesus is rubbish. I don't know about you, but I can go to the cross. I can understand what happened at the cross. I can have a peace that surpasses my understanding. I can walk away with the glory of the Lord, rejoicing because I took it to the point where Jesus Christ had to take it away. And I brought it to him. And if we come to Jesus with anything other than his worthiness coming towards us, it's not right. Did you get what I just said? We have a tendency to go to Jesus and say, look at me. 
I confess my sin. I'm awesome. That's not about Jesus. That's all about you. I want to be plugged into his victory. I want to walk away glorious. I want to walk away rejoicing. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. Do you know God loves you? Did you know if you're the only person on the planet today, he would still die for you? Do you realize that he wants you to be revived, restored, renewed, loved unconditionally more than you do? We don't get that. But he does. That's because that's who he is. I want to walk with the Lord every day. I want to become stable and mature because I'm spending time in his word. I'm spending time in the fellowship of the body of believers. How about if we have church every day? But yet we've narrowed this thing down to an hour or two a week because we want to fill it with something else. We're kind of in a sad state of affairs, actually, but I'm encouraged because people love Jesus. They know he loves them. You guys do. I'm encouraged because we have a fellowship that just gets it and says, Yes, Lord! We want to come together. We want to worship. We want to have triumphant in Christ. This is not be paralyzed by the analysis. Paralysis by the analysis. That's my latest phrase. Let's study it 55 ways and get it figured out. How about if you just tell Jesus about it? Now, that's a novel thought, but it scares people because they know full well that he is the one that can change their life. Last week's message still resonates with many people. It's because the Holy Spirit moved on Saturday night in a very powerful way and Sunday morning. And it was simply this, that we're all living with a lie that nobody wants exposed. Emails, texts, messages, personal encounters in Fergus Falls. And the guy in Fergus Falls told me, he said, when the day comes when you have a night of sharing, he says, I want to be there because I want to tell the fellowship of what happened to me as I was in that worship. Because as I go through my daily routine, he said, it constantly comes up, the lies that I live with. And the lies that I live with haunt me. And I do not walk away from worship rejoicing. That's intense. Because if you live with a lie, if you've never shared the story with Jesus, you come into worship and you sing hallelujah praise and we raise our hands and we make it all look good and we go home in the same way we came in. Jesus looked at the guys that were doing that and he said, your father's the devil. You're not worshiping me. You haven't come clean. You haven't testified to the living God. You're living a lifestyle less than. So what if... What if we were honest with God? You ever go to a family reunion where nobody wants to talk about anything? Everybody drunk, smokes, whatever. Nobody talks about the real issue that three generations back, John Henry, Uncle Roy, whatever his name was, robbed 15 banks and we're all descendants of this mean man. The things that are in the closets of family go to graves with family because they don't want to talk about it. And it keeps them in bondage. Last week I said you either change and grow or you lie and die. And this is a time in the church's life and in our life to expose it, to, to let it air out, <laughs> to be cleansed. What's in the room that you're not talking about? I went way out on a limb. I had to conceal it. You're going to wish it was a cat. I'm going to open this lid on this pail for a little bit. And I'm going to close it up again, I promise. Because Paul says that if we don't expose it, and if we're filling anything other than Christ in our life, it's rubbish. I told you last week what that word translates to. Remember Eugene Peterson? Eugene Peterson, it says, all is dog dung. I have a pail of cow manure in my hand. It's not cow manure, it's calf manure that our feeder calves in the yard, the different odors. <laughs> I'll cover it up again. 
You see my point? <coughs> this pail of manure is in every family. Every family gets together, they know it stinks, they know it's real, they know it's juicy, they know it's ugly, but they never want to talk about it. And in fact, we get so good, we clean around this, we scrub the floor around this, we hang curtains around this, but it's never talked about. Right? Nobody wants the manure to be exposed that's in your life. And Paul says if it's other than Christ, it's rubbish. <laughs> and, and like someone just said, you really don't have to open that. It's a true statement. We don't want to smell it. We don't want to be around it. But yet, if we believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, he took this away. Right? So if we believe it, why don't we want to get rid of it? And we don't want to face it. How would you like to come to church every week smelling this? Sorry to say we do. We do. You know, and I used to pacify this on the farm. That's the smell of money. <laughs> In some ways, it really was. But not this morning. <laughs> What's your pail? You see, we come together week after week and we say that the truth will set, set us free, Jesus' words, and we never talk about it. I've encountered more Christians, not non-Christians, more Christians, that have the ability to point at anything and everything in their life. They can do a 360 degree circle. They'll talk about this, 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 and this, but they never talk about this. And you can smell it. Paul says that if it's not Jesus, it's rubbish. We have a real success story on this. It's Psalm 51. The success, success, success story, can't get that off the tongue, is David after everything in life went sideways. Nothing was good. And listen what he says. He goes to God, he writes a psalm, and he says, God, I've really messed up. And listen carefully to what I've underlined in the text. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according to my steadfast love. No, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, take away my sin. If we don't address the manure in your life, the rubbish in your life, that you're filling the void, you're coming to God and you're saying this, look at me, God. I'm cleaning it up. I took a shower last night. I'm trying. I'm working. It's about my goodness towards you and not his goodness towards us. Do you know the number one reason people don't address the pail is because of what I just said? You come to God and you ask for forgiveness because you want God to look at you thinking you're actually pretty good. I know that's twisted, but if you can let that resonate and let that sink in, that's what we do. We actually go to God and we say, I went to church, I tithed, I studied, I memorized the word, I went to confirmation, I was baptized. Look at me, God. I'm somebody. And because I'm somebody, please forgive me. We beg for God's mercy. And we want God to think that we're something. David got that. David got that. Did, did you get what I just taught you? 
If you come groveling to God and say, man, God, thank you for the blessings. We prayed for rain and it rained. I prayed you gave. This gets very, very close here. God, I asked for forgiveness and you forgave me because I did this. And then we'll have a tendency to go as far and say, God, look at, look at. If you forgive me of this sin, I'll go to church for a year. Nobody's ever done that. God, if you heal this financial crisis I have, I will tithe forever. In the last two weeks. Right? Because we approach God on our goodness. Listen to me loud and clear. David says you approach God and you're forgiven of your sin because of his goodness. This might be hard to get. It doesn't make any difference how bad you've screwed up. It doesn't make any difference how bad you've screwed up because your forgiveness and your worth is based on what God is doing to you. And once you get this, it's a game changer. Because now you can go to God and say, forgive me because you're good, I'm not. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, take away my sin. Wash me thoroughly. I'm not taking a shower myself. You wash me, God. Wash me thoroughly of my iniquity, all my actions. Cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. When you read the Psalms of David, he says, my bones are wasting away. It's like all of them are broke. I'm just weighted down under this sin. And then he confessed it. He confessed it. Against you and only you have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. He gets it. He understands the depth of the depravity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. I'm bad to the core. But you're not. And you can forgive me. He comes to God saying, I'm done. But you're not. Cleanse me. You get the order? We have a tendency to go to God to want to prove ourselves. We want to appeal to God on our goodness. How many times have, a kid, have, have your children come to you and done that? I mean, they, they make you things. I'm sorry. You know, will you forgive me? You ever have a kid do that? We do. And as a parent, whose heart breaks? The kids are yours. Yours. God's heart breaks. Look, God, I'm crying. I'm a victim here. Poor me. God says, listen, I know your pain. I know your sorrow. I understand all that. But you're forgiven because of me, not because of what you're doing. Forgive me based on your goodness, based on your love. While we were still sinners, he died for us. Not waiting for us to get right. So when you pray and ask forgiveness, do you base it on God's work or yours? I love Psalm 51 because David pulled all the plugs. He had no excuses. He said, I'm bad to the bone. You're good. I'm not. And the truth set him free. When you read verse 4 and 5, he understands it's not a genetic disposition. It's not because of a fallout he had with his mom and dad. You realize that verse 4 and 5, he could say against you and only you have I sinned. It doesn't say, my mom abused me when I was six years old and I've never gotten over it. And that's sometimes the case. But he doesn't say that. He says against you and only you have I sinned. As long as we're feeling the weight of the conviction of the sin this morning, what happened to Ananias and Sapphira when they weren't totally true, when they brought the money from selling the farm into the church? They died. And Peter and Paul and everybody else, Paul wasn't there, Peter says, you didn't hurt us. You lied to the Holy Spirit. People, I don't think, realize the depth of, of this when they bring their goodness to God 
and they're trying to make themselves look right, and they want their reputation to stand more than their character. And when your reputation is more than your character, you're lying to God. That doesn't hurt me. That doesn't hurt the person you're defending yourself to. It hurts God. Verse number six, he desires the truth. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your... Next slide there, Matt. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. And your character becomes your destiny, not your reputation. David lived a life, and it says that he was a man that sought after God's heart. Yet he'd done a lot of bad things. But his character is what became his destiny. Because God knew where his heart was, and he knew what he wanted to become. I know there's not too many Sundays when there's a bucket of manure sitting in the middle of the sanctuary. But I think you got the point. That today is the day we're going to deal with that. God doesn't want you to leave here. He says, listen, you're a group of people that confess to believe. You've received the grace. You received the mercy. And if you can't receive my forgiveness coming from my way, you're saying you're better than me. But when you can deal with the bucket, you can say, you know what? Yeah. I'm going to tell you, Lord. I'm going to tell you. And God says, I took it all away. And you don't need to carry that stink anymore. Did the Son of God with the blood of Jesus fulfill? Yes. Does he want you to live? You know what David did at the end of this psalm? He walks away rejoicing. He goes back to work singing hallelujah. And you know what? Who, who the people couldn't get over it? That happens too. Yeah, but you're a murderer. Yeah, but I came clean before the Lord. I'm forgiven. It's between you and him. Not the reputation. The character. He went away rejoicing. It's one of the most powerful parts in the whole psalm for me is the fact that he cleansed, he received. He said, God, you're it. I've been renewed, restored. Hallelujah. Verse number 10. Just jump back to that a minute there, Matt. Created me a clean heart, O oh God. This part of Psalm 51 doesn't fit us today. Why? Because he gave us his son Jesus, he ascended into heaven, and he poured out the Holy Spirit for those who confess to believe, receive it. That wasn't going on yet for David, because David would receive the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit would leave. That happens in the Old Testament all the time. So David pens these words, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, renew the Spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, take not the Holy Spirit from me. You see, when we confess to believe, we receive the Holy Spirit, we have a right spirit, we have a clean heart, and we live in his presence. Isn't that cool? But David knew the weight of it, and he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. We have the joy of the salvation all the time. And yet some churches you've grown up in recite this every Sunday because they want you to feel guilty, they want you to come back to God to say, Look at me, I'm doing this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with your willing spirit. Praise God. When we're born again, believer, we receive him. We have all of that. Amen. We don't have to ask for it. It's there. Ask for the spirit to swell up in you, to stir up in you, to live that life and go away rejoicing. If you deal with the bucket today, you want me to open it again? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you can go away rejoicing. I'm getting calls on the best day of my life, a four-part sermon series, and people are saying, wow. I know I talk about my grandkids a lot, but I'll say, tell you one more thing about them. They've been through a lot. And they honestly can say now that when I have a bad day, which I had a bad day, and I have bad days, and they have moments in their life now that were horrible. But it's okay. It's still the best day of my life because I know Jesus. And the prayer that they continue to pray now and will for the rest of their life is that people's hearts are changed. We can't do anything about their choices and their actions, but that their hearts are changed 
and that they receive Jesus and we'll get to be together for eternity. Best day of my life. When I get to pray that, because the truth has set me free. Genesis 19, 17. We don't want anybody to leave in bondage today. And here's a picture of it. As soon as they had brought them out, Sodom and Gomorrah is being destroyed. God gave specific instructions on how to do it. Flee for your lives. Don't look back. If you deal with a manure bucket today, I don't want you going back there. I don't want you going back there. Did the blood of Jesus do its work? Was it sufficient? Did the old Adam die? Is he in the ground? Is he dead? Why do you keep dragging around the carcass? Someday, and I have it lined up with the funeral home right down the street now, there's going to be a message with a coffin in the church. And we're going to have a guy jump out of there. Because <laughs> it's such a picture that the old man is gone. And if you can walk up to that old man and resurrect him, you are more powerful than Jesus. And you've made a choice to continue to drag that carcass around. And it's starting to stink. Don't look back, and don't stop anywhere on the plane. I love the theology in this. I saved you. I saved you from destruction. Live life in a forward motion. Learn from what happened back there, but push forward. And when you push forward, you don't have to look back. And there's only one way that she could look back. Adam Clark's commentary says this. The only one way that Lot's wife, notwithstanding the divine command, meaning she didn't take to heart what God said. Theologians have a way to write words that are crazy. Why didn't he just say that? She couldn't withstand the divine command and behold God. She went behind her husband so she could turn her head to look back. When you walk behind God, you look back. But when you're on that tandem bike and you're in that front seat, anybody ever ride a tandem bike? We rode one for years. And you're in that front seat, God's in the driver's seat, he guides and directs you. And he says, take a right. Ha! Are you kidding me? I can't see over the edge there. Take a right. He doesn't want you to see it. He says, don't look back. I got you covered. Lot's wife had to go behind her husband to look back. Had she been in front of her husband, he would have said, honey, what did God say? She went against the authority of God. She went against the authority of her husband. She looked back and she turned to a pillar of salt. Probably because she was missing some of the physical belongings such as the house, the earthly possessions, that she had to leave with a reluctance. Some of you are having a hard time leaving the manure pail today because that's your identity. And it becomes a reluctance to let it go. I have cleaned around that for 40 years. I know exactly what it smells like on Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock. I know what it looks like by Friday noon. And you're asking me to let it go? That's who I am. And God says, it's not who you are. That's dead. Let go of who you were, because if it's anything other than Jesus, it's rubbish. Luke 17, 32. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. Today's a day to go home rejoicing. It's dead, it's gone. It's a day to cover it up. The peace of God that surpasses all of our understanding will guard our hearts in mind with Christ Jesus. Do you have the peace? I'm just going to open with a prayer. And if, if you've got a little of this in your life today, 
There wasn't a second sermon in what if so that we could just put on big smiles today. The second sermon of the what if is the very fact to deal with it. And to bring it to God and say, you know what, I've, I have had a special spot for this. But today it's going to go. I get it. It's dead. It's over. And I really don't want to carry it around anymore. I understand that Jesus died for me, and I have come to you, Lord, asking for your forgiveness based on my worth. But today I come to you understanding my forgiveness is based on your worth. And I don't need this anymore. I don't even want to open it. I don't even want to uncover it. Because the aroma is horrific. And let the blood of Jesus just Understand that it did its work. And it's gone. I'll start the prayer. You finish it between you and him. Father, we thank you for the book called the Bible. And in reality, it's simply a living word from your heart. Your heart, your spiritual feelings, emotions, your love, your grace, your mercy. That reveals a God to us that is, is a God who is love and longs to be in relationship with your children. Father, we understand today in the name of Jesus, because any of us who are parents here today, we know what it's like to have a child come groveling back to us, asking for forgiveness based on their worth. When we as a parent understand, we'll forgive our children. And your word tells us that, that if a child asked for a piece of bread, what dad would give him a snake? So Father, we come to you today. Understanding that if we fill this void in our life with anything other than Jesus, it's simply garbage. And that we've carried around some of this garbage. We've carried around, we've protected it. We've lied about it. We've told people crazy stories about it. It's gone to the grave with many people so that the lie can continue from generation to generation. So, Father, we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, for the fellowship that's here today and for those who are watching, that if the Holy Spirit has brought them to a place to say, today is the day, you don't have to carry that pail, you don't have to carry that pain, your purpose, your forgiveness is in Jesus. I give you a time to share with the Holy Spirit the truth that will set you free. Jesus, we thank you for grace. Even in our wayward thoughts and conditions, actions, you still love us. You still love us. Thank you for what you've done here this morning through the power of your Spirit.
Thank you for mercy. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for restoration. Father, let us walk out of here with our shoulders squared back today. Touched and filled with the Holy Spirit. That we can go away rejoicing. So that the world knows. The old Adam's gone. And the Spirit of the living God lives within us. We can go away rejoicing today saying thank you Jesus for your goodness. Father, I thank you for every person here today and their willingness to be changed by a God who simply wants the best for them. Rejoicing. In your name we pray. In preparation for this message, I read a story about a youth convention that just touched me. There was over 30 churches represented in this young man who was graduating from high school. For four years, he had been the president of their youth group. He had organized trips. He had led Bible studies. He had done all the things that a Christian young man should do. And he was, he was lifted up in the church, and he was looked at. This is who you want to be like. And at this convention, at the first breakout session, on the first day at noon, they said, you know, if you're dealing with anything, we want you to come down and we want to pray with you. And some of the kids from some of the churches came, and a few of the kids from this church came down, and this kid was one of them, big strapping football pair, had his big cowboy hat on, boots. And he got up there in front of his peers, and he said, you, you don't have a clue who I am. You don't know me. And they were like, yeah, we know you, you know. He said, for the last four years, my life has slowly digressed. As a freshman, I was having sex with an older girl. And I was teaching you about how to live a godly purity life. As a sophomore, I started to dabble in drugs. I started to hang out with the wrong crowd at night after hours when none of you could see me. As a junior, I started to dabble around with homosexuality. And my life continued to go down. And he says, as I speak to you today, I'm trying to convince my younger brother that homosexuality is okay. You could have heard a pin drop in the whole place. Nobody knew him. But he confessed it. And what was brought to the light could no longer stay in the dark. Changed the tone of the whole convention, they said. They never even really had a convention. They just had sessions where people could share. And kids started to bring forth issues and things that they were living with, all because of one guy's willingness to confess. There's a lot of truth in that. When we as Christians come clean, and I'm going to dump this out in the bean field, because it's gone, right? It's gone. Amen.